Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Father Ed. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be here. This is my first visit to Pembury, but I hope it will not be my last. So I've been given this title, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, this particular clause of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and Father Ed said that I might angle it towards C.S. Lewis, given that that's my special field of interest. Um, so if you were expecting a particularly erudite, biblical, theological unpacking of the Lord's Prayer, uh, you've come to the wrong event. <laughs> but if you want an exploration of the term heaven and how C.S. Lewis understood it in his writings, um, hopefully you will leave this evening thinking that you have come to the right event. But let us begin with something scriptural. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Those are the opening verses of Psalm 19. And C.S. Lewis described the 19th Psalm as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. And his ruminations upon the heavens, the planets, the stars, and in particular how uh, in medieval times it was thought that there were seven heavens with seven planets uh, that's going to be largely the, the subject of my remarks tonight. But first of all, let us um, disambiguate, as Wikipedia likes to put it, let us disambiguate two confusable terms, namely heaven and space. In 1961, the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became both the first man to travel in space and the first man to orbit the Earth. His, his Vostok 1 spacecraft was launched in April 1961 and the entire flight took less than two hours. And in recognition of his achievement, Gagarin was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union, the nation's highest honour. And 50 years later, in 2011, the United Nations marked the event by declaring that date in April, the 12th of April, to be the International Day of Human Space Flight. There's glory for you. And what does this have to do with C.S. Lewis? Well, in a letter he wrote shortly after Yuri Gagarin's flight, Lewis described this first venture into space as very exciting a reaction that he might have been expected to have, given his long-standing interest in interplanetary adventure. But his more considered and substantial response to Gagarin's historic journey came a little bit later, when he published an article entitled Onward Christian Spaceman. Uh, and in that, he opened his argument by writing, the Russians, I am told, he said, the Russians, I am told, report that they have not found God in outer space. A report that left him unperturbed. He went on, finding God by astronautics is impossible because the methods of science do not discover facts of that order. What is required is a certain faculty of recognition. Much depends on the seeing eye. Now, this report by the Russians that they had not found God in outer space originated, so I understand, not with remarks from the astronaut himself, Yuri Gagarin, but by the Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, who told a meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party that Gagarin flew into space but didn't see any God there. But it wasn't long before Khrushchev's words about Gagarin were attributed to Gagarin. And now every meme artist in the world assumes that he did utter that line, I see no God up here. But why would the Russians think that God might have been found in outer space? 
Well, I suppose it's because of the opening words of the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in space, hallowed be thy name. Or perhaps the Russians were thinking of the first verse of the Bible, the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created space and the earth. Or perhaps they were thinking of that article of the creed. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into space. Whether it be in the Lord's Prayer or the book of Genesis or the Apostles' Creed, heaven is a key term in Christian belief. Heaven, note, not space. When we use space instead of heaven, as here, we immediately see that the two terms aren't actually interchangeable. But Khrushchev and the atheist propagandists whom he oversaw in Russia deliberately confuse the two terms for their own purposes. Because if if God is supposed to reside in heaven, and heaven equals space, yet a spaceman doesn't see God up there, then God evidently is in heaven, and God therefore cannot exist. QED. Irrefutable logic. But the Russian's linguistic sleight of hand does raise a real question. Why should we not say space instead of heaven? What really distinguishes these words from each other? And this was a question that greatly exercised C.S. Lewis. In his book Miracles, he, uh, he writes this. We may, he said, conveniently distinguish four senses of the word heaven. One, the unconditioned divine life beyond all worlds. That is, you know, God in his own eternal self. Two, blessed participation in that divine life by a created spirit. So the the perfected saints in heaven, they go to that heaven. They participate in God's own life. They become partakers of the divine nature. Or three, a slightly larger sense of heaven, by which Lewis means the whole nature or system of conditions in which those redeemed human spirits can enjoy such participation fully and forever. So there we might think of heaven as, you know, a a, a kingly court. Um, You know, the the mansion, the place of many mansions that Jesus goes ahead to prepare prepare a place for us in heaven. And fourthly, Lewis says, the other meaning of heaven is simply the physical heaven, the sky, the space in which earth moves, the canopy over our heads. And he goes on in Miracles and says this, that we shouldn't be too worried if when we use heaven theologically in in one of those first three senses, that the picture we have in our mind is actually the fourth sense the canopy over our heads. He says, it's not an accident that people, however spiritual, should blend the ideas of God and heaven and the blue sky, or indeed the night sky. It is a fact, not a fiction, that light and life-giving heat do come down from the sky to the earth. So the analogy of the sky's role to begetting and of the earth's role to bearing is sound as far as it goes. The huge dome of the sky is of all things sensuously perceived the most like infinity. And when God made space and worlds that move in space and clothed our world with air and gave us such eyes and such imaginations as those we have, God knew what the sky would mean to us. And since nothing in God's work is accidental, if God knew, he intended. So that's quite an important point, I think, that heaven is very difficult to conceive of, except by reference, first of all, to the physical thing above our heads. And we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We we shouldn't try to skirt round. God has given us the heaven in order to symbolise for us that spiritual reality which is somehow not exactly the same as that though there may be some sort of overlap it's hard to say 
But this question about the space and the heavens really did occupy quite a lot of Lewis's mind and imagination. Um, he, he wrote a trilogy of interplanetary adventures called the Cosmic Trilogy. This is the first, <coughs> the first novel in that trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet, and it's set on Mars. And in the second book of the trilogy, uh, the hero of the story goes to Venus. And in the third book, which is set on Earth, the, the planetary powers, the, the angels, the, 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 the angelic gods and goddesses that steer the planets, they come down to Earth uh, to bring about the end of the whole trilogy. And uh, towards the beginning of this story, when the hero, whose name is Ransom, Elwyn Ransom, he's a Cambridge uh, professor, He's been kidnapped and he's been taken to Mars by the villains of the story. Uh, he looks out the window of his spaceship and he marvels, he glories in the picture that meets his eye. We read this passage. A nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science was falling off Ransom. He had read of space at the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black, cold vacuity, the utter deadness which was supposed to separate the worlds. He had not known how much it affected him till now, now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous libel for this Empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. He could not call it dead. He felt life pouring into him from it every moment. No, space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they named it simply the heavens, the heavens which declared the glory. Psalm 19 being alluded to there. So I don't know what you typically think of when you look up at the night sky, when, or when you think of the term space. Lewis was of the view that the term space, which is really a, a, a 17th century word, it's quite a modern term in the history of the English language, um, he thought that the introduction of that term space had introduced into the human imagination a whole new concept of emptiness, hollowness, vacuity, blackness, deadness, just empty space. Whereas before the 17th century, before, before the astronomical revolution that Copernicus brought in, you couldn't have talked about space. That word was literally not available to you in that sense. You would have looked up, not into space, you would have looked up into the heavens, the heavens that declare the glory. Space is the wrong name. Space is a blasphemous libel, we're told. So it's highly ironic, actually, that this uh, trilogy of stories that Lewis wrote uh, is now commonly referred to by publishers as the Space Trilogy. <laughs> Lewis himself never called it the Space Trilogy, and he wouldn't have, uh, for reasons I've just explained. It's much better to call it the Ransom Trilogy or the Cosmic Trilogy. I sometimes fancy that you could best call it the Heavens Trilogy, uh, but that's never going to catch on. Have, have, have anybody, has any of you read this trilogy or parts of it? A few? Yes? A handful? Yeah, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's, it's very good. Uh, it's, it's very different from Narnia. If you know C.S. Lewis for Narnia, uh, this is very different, but equally good in, in a different way. Uh, Lewis was so various in his output. Of course, he, he wasn't professionally a writer of fiction of any kind, either space science fiction or children's fiction. He was uh, professionally an academic. This is the last book he ever wrote, The Discarded Image, an introduction to medieval and Renaissance literature. Because, of course, he spent his whole career at Oxford and then f finished it at Cambridge uh, teaching uh, medieval and Renaissance English. And I put this cover up because in this uh, book he has a whole chapter entitled The Heavens, in which he explores how the heavens were understood. Uh, in the Middle Ages. And of course, uh, before the time of Copernicus, it was thought that the earth was static and central, surrounded not by empty space, but by a series of ranked heavens or 
concentric spheres, or globes, crystalline spheres that uh, rotated around Earth, and each sphere or heaven had its own planet, and each planet had its own influences that it would shed upon the Earth and upon people and events and even the metals in Earth's crust. So let's just remind ourselves of these seven heavens. The first was that of the moon, Luna, as she was called in, uh, in, in medieval times. Above the moon came Mercury, then Venus in the third heaven. And you may recall in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the second letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul talks of a man he knows who was taken up in Christ to the third heaven. So this idea of a series of ranked heavens exists in Jewish cosmology uh, just as much as it does in Western European cosmology. And it's, it's certainly not a, just a medieval idea. It goes back to time immemorial. And, and the Jews sometimes had three heavens, sometimes had seven. Uh, depends uh, who you consult. Above Venus came the sun. The sun was regarded as a planet. A planet is literally a wandering star. Planetai in Greek means wanderers. These are the wandering stars. They take their unique paths across the heavens. And all the other celestial bodies are not planets, but stars, because they are fixed in their constellations. Above the sun came Mars, then Jupiter, and finally in the seventh heaven, Saturn. And still today, occasionally, we hear people say, maybe you say this yourself, oh, I was in the seventh heaven of delight. Uh, why is it delightful to be in the seventh heaven? I suppose because up there, you're furthest away from earth and all its trials and tribulations. If you keep going up, you will eventually emerge out of the created order altogether. So it was thought in medieval times, and you'll enter the very home of God, the, the uncreated heaven. So this is the image of the cosmos that, that we have discarded. We no longer believe the universe to be like this. That's why Lewis calls his book The Discarded Image. But of course we have retained this understanding, at least in one sense, because of course it, uh, these seven heavens give us the names of the days of the week. It's obvious how Saturn Day and Sunday and Moon Day are connected to their presiding planets. With the other four days of the week, it's a bit less obvious to us in English because for some reason in English we, we use the Norse names rather than the Roman names uh, for the planetary characters. But if you think in French, it's a bit more obvious because, uh, you know, Wednesday is Mercury's day, or Mercredi in French, or Venus... Uh, presides over Friday, so Vendredi in French, and likewise for the other two. So Jeudi, Thor's day, Jeudi, think of Jove's day, Jupiter's day. Uh, that's the connection there. And of course, Mardi, Mars, Mars's day, Mardi Gras. Uh, it's, it's still in our language. Every day of our lives is being shaped, though we have forgotten it, by, by reference to this old cosmological system. But C.S. Lewis wanted to keep alive in his readers' minds and in his students' minds an understanding of this old system because, of course, it's everywhere presupposed in the literature that he was paid to teach. The backdrop, the cosmological backdrop to our lives these days is, is Einsteinian, isn't it? We, we now believe in the general theory of relativity and, and curved space and, and black holes and wormholes and all sorts of weird things which nobody can understand except about three people. Um, and it's interesting how Einsteinian relativity in physics has seeped into uh, the broader culture. So a lot of philosophy these days, which is relativistic, owes some of its sources to, to cosmology and, and physics. The backdrop to our, our lives, the, the, the cosmological backdrop, has, has an impact sooner or later in, the, in how we understand ourselves and the sorts of stories we're able to tell about ourselves. But in the Middle Ages, when you still believe that the Earth was the centre of everything and surrounded by the seven heavens, 
Well, that gave quite a different backdrop to, to literature and the arts and philosophy. And perhaps the greatest poem of the Middle Ages was Dante's masterpiece, The Divine Comedy. And in The Divine Comedy, the pilgrim mounts up through the seven heavens in his ascent to the throne of God, to the very heaven itself. So here's an image uh, from, an, from an edition of The Divine Comedy, and it shows you the seven planetary characters in the order of the days of the week. So here on the left we have the sun for Sunday in his burning fiery chariot. Here's the moon for Monday in her silvery gown holding her crescent. The moon would make you a lunatic uh, because the moon was so changeable. It was, was responsible for the wandering of the wits. Mars, the Mardi for Tuesday. Mars, the god of war with his helmet and his Chain mail, making you martial and militaristic. Mercury for Wednesday, Mercury. We know he's Mercury because you can just see the, the wings on his heels. So Mercury was the, the fleet-footed messenger of the gods. Then Thor, or Jupiter for Thursday. You see that rod over his shoulder? That's the kingly scepter, the staff of of royal office because Jupiter was associated with all things regal and royal and monarchical. Venus for Friday in her green gown because Venus was associated with fertility and creativity and love. When you venerate someone, when you, when you lovingly respect someone, you're, you're venerating because Venus is inspiring your veneration. You see the trace in the language. And finally, Saturn for Saturday with his sickle because Saturn was associated with old age and death and disaster and our more modern picture of Father Time with his scythe and his hourglass is based on earlier pictures of Saturn C.S. Lewis points out and Lewis had a not just a historical and academic interest in these seven heavens he, he responded to them much more imaginatively as well he said the characters of the planets seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. Of Saturn, we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Job, of Jupiter? So this is a very important quotation, as far as I'm concerned, for, for understanding uh, C.S. Lewis and his imagination. He thinks of the seven heavens as, as not just historical curiosities fit for those superstitious medieval people. No, he says that they have a permanent value as spiritual symbols. They have a continuing worth in the human imagination. We'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. But why does he say they were especially worthwhile in his own generation? Well, remember, C.S. Lewis's generation was the generation that went through the First World War. Lewis was a teenage officer in the British Army during the Great War and he served in the French trenches for six months before being blown up and very nearly killed in the spring of 1918. And that's why he says of Saturn, we know more than enough. So Saturn with his sickle, cutting people down, was all too familiar a figure, symbolically speaking, in Lewis's generation. You know, three quarters of a million British servicemen were killed in the Great War, not to mention those who were injured. And Lewis would sometimes talk about the culture of the 1920s and 30s as Saturnocentric. Saturnocentric. Fixated upon Saturn's qualities. You know, these Saturnine influences of death and disaster and bleakness and pessimism a quite understandable, natural reaction in some ways to the huge trauma of the First World War, but not an eternal truth about the nature of the universe, because as far as Lewis was concerned, uh, a much better way of symbolising the heart of spiritual reality is through the, the heaven of Jupiter. Who does not need to be reminded of Job? Because Job was the king. He was this regal and magnanimous, festive prosperous symbol. And so I mention all this because it's not, not just, you know, of academic interest, I hope, but also 
of imaginative traction because Lewis's best known works, the Seven Chronicles of Narnia, are informed by, uh, constructed upon, infused with these seven planetary spiritual symbols. At least that's what I believe, that's what I uh, have written about extensively in, in, in my book, Planet Narnia, that's what the BBC documentary was all about. Um, rather astonishingly, Lewis kept this secret. He never told anybody that this was what he was up to. And it just burst upon me one night when I was doing my PhD researches into C.S. Lewis. And once you begin to look at it and see it, you, you can't not see it. It's so obvious. It's staring us in the face if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Now, I don't have time to go through all seven chronicles, uh, but let me very quickly give you an, an introductory taste of, of what I mean about this. Because I think it's not only of interest to you if you know the Narnia books, and I expect most of us do, um, it's also got some sort of purchase upon us more, sort of more theologically and doctrinally and spiritually, because it actually does feed into this, this very phrase that Father Ed has asked me to talk about, on earth as it is in heaven. This, I think, is one of the things that Lewis is trying to depict, portray imaginatively within the Narnia world. So who does not need to be reminded of Jove, of Jupiter? Here is Jupiter, the planet. And here in the southeast corner, you can just make out the great red eye, the great red spot of Jupiter. That's a storm perpetually raging on the surface of Jupiter. And the diameter of that eye is greater than the diameter of Earth. You could fit the whole of us a whole, of, a whole of our planet inside just that little red bit of Jupiter. Shows you how massive Jupiter is. And here is Jupiter, the king of the planetary powers. Now, as I mentioned, I, I, this idea that there was a connection between the heavens and the Narnia Chronicles burst in upon me when I was halfway through my PhD researchers. I was lying in bed one night and I was reading a long poem about the planets that C.S. Lewis wrote. Long, complicated poem, all about the seven heavens. And I got to these lines about Jupiter and did a double take. Of wrath ended and woes mended, of winter past and guilt forgiven and good fortune, Jove is master. Now, I did a double take because, of course, the central uh, event in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I'm sure you remember this, is the, pass <coughs> is the passing of winter. The White Witch has made it always winter and never Christmas. But at the coming of Aslan, her kingdom of ice and snow passes, and Edmund's guilt is forgiven. You remember Edmund has betrayed his, his, sister and his sisters and his brother, and his guilt is forgiven by the, the sacrificial death of the Christ character, Aslan. So I began to think more closely about what I knew C.S. Lewis to have understood by the term Jove and joviality. There's strong themes of kingship, as I've already mentioned. But there's also this strange connection with Christ. Now, of course, Christ is the king of kings. But why would you connect Christ's kingship with Jupiter's kingship? Interestingly, in the same year that Lewis began writing The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, he published another book about the poetry of his great friend Charles Williams, who was one of the Inklings, you know, that group of writers that met in Oxford, Lewis, Tolkien, Charles Williams and a whole band of others. And in that book, C.S. Lewis says this, when Charles Williams writes of Jupiter's red pierced planet, he assumes that the huge reddish spot which astronomers observe on the surface of Jupiter is a wound, and the redness is that of blood. Jupiter, a planet of kingship, thus wounded, becomes another ectype, another reflection of the divine king wounded on Calvary. So we see here that Lewis very explicitly connects Jupiter symbolism with the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. 
Which is why at the heart of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, we have not just all these themes of the passing of winter and, uh, and of kingship and of the forgiving of guilt, but of the forgiving of guilt by the death of a sacrificial king. Here's a, uh, here's a medieval woodcut. See, this is labelled Jupiter. So this is Jupiter in, in his heaven, as it were. And down on earth are the people who exhibit the jovial influences. So here we have a man kneeling to be crowned the king. Uh, this is the Pope, by the way. You see there in his triple crown, his triple tiara. Here's another man kneeling for judgment. Is his guilt going to be forgiven or not, we might say. In the background, you can just make out horses and hounds hunting the white stag, the white hart that kings and queens would hunt for in medieval romances and that comes into the lion, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe too in the final chapter. On earth, as it is in heaven, Jupiter, with all his regal and kingly and jovial influences, sheds them upon people so that they begin to participate in the divine attributes. And we see the same thing being worked out a second time in the second Chronicle of Narnia, the Prince Caspian book, uh, which is all about Mars. If you saw the recent film version, you may remember how they went to town on the battle scenes. But you might say there are battles in some of the other Narnia books. So what makes this a, a peculiarly martial story? Well, it's partly the centrality of those battles. It's partly that the word martial appears in this book, but never again in any of the others. What clinches it, though, has to do with the, with the trees and the forests running through this story. They're everywhere. Aslan wakes the trees. The trees come for the final battle. Why all these trees? It's because in Roman thought, in Roman mythology, Mars was not only the god of battle, he was also the god of trees and forests, and he was known as Mars Silvanus. Here's a mural from Pompeii which shows you Mars in both capacities at once. He's the god of war, yes, with his shield and his spear and his helmet, but he's standing against the backdrop of burgeoning vegetation. Think of the, the month of March, the third month of the year. Why do we call it March? Sacred to Mars in both capacities at once, because in the third month of the year, the, the weather is getting good enough for armies to march off to battle, but the trees are coming back to life after winter. So in Prince Caspian... Here's just one scene from Prince Caspian to sum up this, uh, this aspect of the story. We have the military combat, the single combat, the, 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 the battling aspect of Mars in the foreground, but in the background you can see the trees, and they're described in this book as dryads and hammer dryads and sylvans. Only in this book are they ever called sylvans, because Lewis is here nodding to... Mars in the capacity of Mars Silvanus. All right, what's this got to do with anything? <laughs> well, Aslan is the true Mars. He's the true Lord of hosts, mighty in battle, to use a biblical term. And the boys in this story harden into knights as they come under his spirit, under his influence. And the girls romp in the, in the revelry with the swaying trees and the growing vines. On earth, as it is in heaven, they begin to participate in the divine nature. Thirdly, the voyage of the Dawn Treader is the sun book, which you could really guess from the title alone, because this is a story about a journey towards the dawn, the place of the rising sun. And this is a book full of gold imagery and light imagery and sunshine. Remember that uh, episode on the island with the magic pool that turns everything to gold. Gold, of course, was the sun's metal. And when the children in the story realise that they, get, they could become fabulously wealthy thanks to this magic water, Aslan suddenly appears on the hillside and shames them into silence. And we're told that Aslan was shining as if in bright sunlight, though the sun had in fact gone in. Because Aslan in this story is figured as the true son. He's the light of the world. Again, to use a biblical term, Jesus calls himself the light of the world in John's Gospel. Light imagery, gold imagery, but also dragon imagery 
Let me go back a moment. You see, the ship itself is shaped like a dragon. You remember how Eustace is turned into a dragon? In Greek mythology, the god of light was Apollo, and he famously slew dragons. That was what he did. If you know your Homer, Homer's hymn to Apollo, he went around killing dragons. And, and so when Eustace is turned into a dragon, this is a still from the recent film version, this is Eustace's eyeball after he's been endragoned. You can see the approaching figure of that man. He's going to come and rip off the dragon skin and turn Eustace back into a boy again. Because that's what the sun influence did. It killed the dragonishness in our nature. And at the end of the story, you may remember, as they reach the eastern end of the world, the water becomes like drinkable light. And they take it down into themselves in deep, enriching draughts, and they can stare straight into the sun. They take on all these solar properties themselves, the children, as they relate to Aslan, the Christ figure in their world, who is depicted by means of solar imagery. Let me just list the final four and then I'll shut up and we can have a quick question or, on, uh, a question or two. The Silver Chair, of course, is the moon book. You could guess this from the title because the moon's metal was silver. This is a book full of wetness and wanderings and lunacy. And The Horse and His Boy is the Mercury story, full of words, language, messages, running, twins, boxing, theft, and all that strange uh, cluster of mercurial images and Aslan in this book is the word of God. Again, to use a, a biblical term. I mean, don't, don't get hung up on the, on the classical mythology and the medieval astrology. All of this is rooted, finally, in Lewis's imagination in the Bible. But he just goes a long way around through his, his classical knowledge and his medieval expertise, enriching his, his biblical theology as he goes. And the Venus book is the magician's nephew. This is the story in which Narnia is created. This is the story of the first joke and the command to love. And the last battle, of course, is the Saturn story because in this story all the characters who are alive at the start of the tale are dead by the end of it. And it is, in fact, Father Time with his scythe and his hourglass who brings Narnia to an end in the great... Narnian Apocalypse. This is the Narnian version of the book of Revelation. Aslan as the judge of all, bringing in the end times. So why would C.S. Lewis do this, uh, assuming this theory is correct? Well, I think it is in large part for the very reason that it's sort of encapsulated in that phrase from the Lord's Prayer. On earth as it is in heaven. As in the influences of the planets, which Lewis understood symbolically. He, he wasn't a literal believer in astrology. He, this is all poetry and symbol. But on, in earth, in earth as in heaven, you become jovial in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. You become martial in the Prince Caspian story. You become solar in the dawn treader. You take on the divine attributes. You grow into relationship with, with God, depicted as Aslan. And Aslan himself sums up the planetary character in his own person. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Thank you very much. There you are. Absolutely fantastic. There you are. I think... Uh...